I'm going to turn to Luke's Gospel and uh, reading just a few verses from chapter number 5. It's an episode in the life of the Lord Jesus when he meets a leper. So Luke's Gospel in chapter number 5 and uh, we're going to read together from verse 12. I'll give Tam his glasses back. I'm not going to do much good to me, Tam, the glasses. But... So Luke 5 and verse number 12. Just a few verses. If you have your Bibles, you can follow. If not, um, you can just listen as we read them. So Luke chapter 5, verse number 12, which says, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Let's just ask again for God's blessing on his word. Our Father, we do again just come into thy presence and we thank thee for the living word of God. We thank thee, our Father, for the person of the Lord Jesus. And we give thanks, our Father, for the way that he has and does meet men and women in their need. We pray, Father, for grace to share this great message of the uh, power of the Lord Jesus to save and transform lives. And we ask, our Father, that thou would bless the word to each of our hearts this afternoon. And to bless our Father, our hearts, to this gracious word that is given to us. Give us help, Father, we pray, as we ask for that help in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we've just read about an episode there in the life of the Lord Jesus where he meets a leper. And that section is introduced in a, maybe in a slightly unusual way, as uh, Luke uh, records, uh, and it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. And it's very interesting that as you go through the Gospels and as you see the kind of people the Lord Jesus Christ uh, met, that quite often the Gospels are very specific as to the place and as to the people. And maybe there are some names that you and I are aware of that the Lord Jesus Christ met and we can name them. Maybe not name them and shame them, but we can certainly name them. People like Bartimaeus, the blind man, or Nicodemus, the intellectual, the philosopher, the rabbi that came to the Lord Jesus, or Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, and his daughter was healed. And maybe, too, there are certain places that you know that the Lord Jesus was at, places like Nazareth and Jerusalem. But here in this section, it's, uh, it's very, very vague in a sense. There's, there's no place and there's no person named. Now, of course, the Gospels are often very specific about who the Lord Jesus Christ met. And that's very interesting for us if we're Christians, that we know that the Gospels nailed the time and the place and the person. And so it's very easy, isn't it, just to be vague about things. But if you say the Lord Jesus Christ met a certain person in a certain place at a certain time, it's more difficult, of course, to, 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 to avoid the facts. But here, interestingly, at the end, at the beginning of this section, the Lord Jesus meets a person, no name, in a place, no name. Here's, a, here's one of the many nobodies, in a sense, that the Lord Jesus Christ met. He's a leper. He's a man who's on the outside of society. He's a man that you really wouldn't probably want to have much to do with if you knew much about leprosy. He's one of these individuals that, that really fall into this category of people that so often the Lord Jesus met. People that were on the outside. People that had no great consequence as far as society was concerned. And oftentimes, interestingly, in the Gospels, when the Saviour meets a leper, or he meets a blind man, or he meets someone who's not a Jew, they don't have a name. They don't really seem to matter in the overall picture of this world. But it's tremendous to see that the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a tremendously encouraging section this, that the Lord Jesus Christ takes a nobody and makes him a somebody. He's a, he's a saviour who's able to lift up the beggar, as we find in the Old Testament of the Scripture. He's able to lift them up from the dunghill and to set them amongst princes. This individual might not mean anything to the people in his society, but he's precious 
to the person of Jesus Christ. This person might be very much on the outside. He might be very much in the outskirts of this world. But as far as the Lord Jesus, here's a soul that is of infinite importance to Christ because here is a soul that Christ died for. Here is a Christ that is infinitely valuable because it was for the sins of this individual that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, was nailed to a cross for. It was because of the sins of this individual that the Lord Jesus Christ entered into death and suffered and purchased salvation for us. And that gave him tremendous value. And so if you're here this afternoon and you're worrying about what is it all about and do I really mean anything to anybody? Is there really any value or substance to my life? And that is a big issue in the 21st century. It is a tremendously big issue. Sadly, we live in a day when suicide is becoming so prevalent, especially amongst young men, as well as some young women, but particularly amongst young men, as that sense of deep despair and meaninglessness, purposeless, do I really matter? Do I matter to anyone? Well, as we open up the Word of God, we can set a foundation for our life that we do mean something. We mean something not because of what others might think about us or what we mean to them, but we mean something because we're created in the image of God. For his glory. For his eternal purpose. We mean something because the Son of God loved us. We mean something because of the cross of Calvary that purchased salvation for us. And there is a value that is attached to us that is infinitely greater than any value that society or anybody else might attach to us. And so this man, what was his name? I don't know. (laughs) Where did he meet him? I don't know. But he meant something to the Lord Jesus. He was a nobody that the Lord Jesus Christ made a somebody. There was a man... A number of years ago, who got saved from the streets of Ayr. He used to come here to some of our prayer meetings at times. Tam was his name. And uh, he used to sit up the back and part of the, and, and part of the prayer meeting. T- Tam was a, he was a kind of down and out. He, was, he had lots of alcohol problems. He would tell you all about his problems. He was covered in scars from where he'd been beaten up. And maybe he'd beaten a few other folk up. He had a rough, rough life, a hard life, Tam. But, you know, he often used to open up his prayers and thank God that God was a God who took a nobody and made him a somebody. And Tam knew the glory of that. And we have that here in Luke chapter 5, as God takes a nobody and makes him a somebody. Now that man, of course, is described here in verse 12 as a leper, a man full of leprosy. That's interesting. Maybe I should just fill you in a little bit that that Luke, who wrote this gospel, uh, he's described elsewhere in the scriptures as the physician, a beloved physician. He's a doctor. And oftentimes, as you go through Luke's gospel, you'll find that descriptions of disease are given a little bit of an extra thing, a little bit of a kind of, uh, maybe a little bit of a professional twist. And so this man isn't just a leper, he's full of leprosy. He has got what we call today lepromatous leprosy. You could see the leprosy in his face. You, You could identify him. You would have no problems identifying him as a leper. You would look at him and you would see that his nose had become crushed and broken as the cartilage had got eaten up. You could see the wrinkles in his brow as the nerve cells had got swollen. You would maybe look at his fingers and you would see they weren't all present. Some of them had broken off, becoming uh, decayed and rotten. Here was a man who was utterly full of leprosy. Now it's interesting that as you go back into the Old Testament of the Bible, uh, you will find... Uh, that there's a great shortage of diagnosis of disease in the Old Testament. In fact, as far as I'm aware, in the first five books of our Bible, in the books of Moses, there is only one specified disease, as far as I'm aware, and that's leprosy. If you were to go to the International Classification of Disease number 11, you would find that there are now 70,000 diseases known uh, regarding humanity. 70,000. But for some reason, God picks one. Just the one. That's pretty selective. And he makes mention of it in the book of Leviticus. In fact, he devotes a number of chapters just to one out of 70,000. And that makes leprosy pretty unique, pretty unusual, and very special in the Bible. It's special, of course, because when you begin to, you, when you begin to look at the leper in the Old Testament, and you look at the way that the Bible speaks about the leper, something strikes you as quite unusual. About, of all of the references in the Old Testament to cleansing, most of them are to the leper. In other words, the leper is unclean. There's something about him that needs to be cleaned. Uh, as, you, as you look at the leper, you, you begin to see there's something undesirable about him. He's to be separated from everybody else. 
and he's to go about crying unclean, unclean. There's something about him, something uh, that's just a bit fearful. You don't want to catch it. Something that separates him from everybody else. Something that's undesirable. Something that's maybe even a little repulsive. And of course, as the Bible describes a leper in the Old Testament, the, the, uh, my response to the leper is really a, a description of God's reaction to me and my sin. That fearfulness and that rejection, that separation, that distinctiveness between the healthy and the unhealthy, the clean and the unclean, is really a description of where humanity stands before a perfect, a holy and a pure God. You see, it's so difficult for me as a person ever to put my, my mind in, in God's shoes. Difficult for me to put, me, put myself in your shoes. How much more difficult for me to put myself in the shoes of the absolute holiness of of God, of of the one that sits upon the the throne of judgment. And as you go through the Old Testament, you get a picture of it. You get a picture of a person there who is living a death and who's dying a life. A person who's slowly being consumed by infection and decay. Uh, a person who's separate, a person who's an outsider, a person who desperately needs a miracle and who desperately needs clean. That's the leper. But listen, that leper in a sense is you and I. Not because of any physical disease, but because of that condition that we have. It's a condition that the Bible would describe not so much in terms of physical disease, but in spiritual disease. That all have sinned falling short of the glory of God. In fact, a bit like that leper slowly decaying from his disease. That was the condition before the first treatments came out in the 1950s for leprosy. Uh, You slowly decay. Bits of you literally fell off. It it was like those things that now appear on the television. You know, these zombie films that you see. Well, I don't watch them. Too scary for me. But if you did watch such a thing, it it is almost like that. It is almost like that. It is a slow living death literally, or a dying life, slowly decaying and pieces literally of the body uh, falling off. That is the picture that we find painted in the New Testament of you and I as a sinner, dying in our life and living a death, ultimately to come to a conclusion of death, separation and eternal corruption. Now, um, there is something positive though that we could say about a leper. That's all pretty negative, isn't it? There's something positive. Let's have a look at this. You would have no, no, no problem at all, I'm sure, identifying that leper there in verse 12. And if you did uh, have any problem, you, you, would, you would soon be very clear about what he was because he would shout at you, <laughs> unclean, unclean. So you know exactly who he is. And in fact, maybe like some here today would have a mask on too. But maybe that's not so specific in, in 2021. But he would have had a mask on and he would have shouted, unclean, unclean. No bother identifying the leper. But let me show you something wonderful about a leper. This leper uh, does something that maybe uh, isn't so common and uh, wasn't so common in those days and maybe isn't so common in these days. Verse number 12, uh, concerning the leper, it says, Who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Here's something wonderful about this leper. Whilst you and I might be able to identify the leper, this leper is able to identify Jesus Christ. There's something wonderful about a leper in that he knows that he desperately needs help. He's a leper who who desperately needs hope. And he's a leper who's willing to just fall on his face before the Lord Jesus. He's a man who who doesn't have to stand upon his own pride or reputation because he doesn't have any. (laughs) He's not worried about what he thinks. He knows this is his last chance, his only chance. Do you know how long it's been since a leper got cured in those days? About a thousand years. Last one was in the days just before the the Moses law was passed. (laughs) But a thousand years waiting for the cure of a leper. He knows that there's only one possible source that, that, that he could ever look for cure from. And that's from the God of heaven. And now he lets out a cry. To the God of heaven, the son of the God of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. He lets out one of these great biblical cries that ought to come from our own hearts. He fell on his face and besought him saying, Lord, if you will, can you make me clean? Can you make me clean? Make me clean. 
One of those great Bible cries, a, a bit like uh, the cry of David, uh, uh, or, 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 or the cry of um, Bartimaeus, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me. Or, or, or David, save me, Lord, save me, Lord, have mercy upon me, make me clean. Or that desperate cry that you find at the end of Luke's Gospel as two men hang with the Lord Jesus Christ in the centre and somebody has just turned up the egg timer and the sand is slipping through. There are only moments from the eternal. Both of them realise it. They're under no delusion that they've got tomorrow. They know for a certain they don't. It's a wake-up call. The nails and the cross. It's absolutely imminent meeting God and there's the cry Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and so here is one of these great cries and it takes a leper there's not many you see as you go through the gospels or Luke's gospel not many that make out one of these great cries can I just well if I had a highlighter I think it would be worth putting a highlighter through that one can you make me clean can you make me clean um, sometimes it takes just seeing ourselves like the leper before we can say that there's a great barrier you know I think in the human heart to asking the Lord Jesus to make me clean it's a barrier that I think is in the infection and the curse of our society that we think we're all doing fine and every kind of sin that we stumble over and every kind of sin that destroys us and every sin that, that corrupts us we make excuses for it and we say it's actually right fine here's a man uh, a man that is under no delusion about who he is and what he is a man that's under no delusion that one day he's uh, and maybe very soon he's going to meet the God that made him uh, one day he's got death itself impressed upon him and he sees himself as a leper I wonder I know that none of us have that diagnosis I've got access to most of your medical notes so I know that you don't have the diagnosis of leprosy I know that you don't, but maybe spiritually, can we see ourselves as, as a leper? Can, can, can we see that maybe in our conscience, a conscience that troubles us, and we realise that sense of separation between us and God? Do, do, we, do we see it maybe in, in, in our thoughts in the middle of the night? Or maybe on those occasions when woken in the middle of the night, there's been that sense of deep fear, that one day we're going to meet God and things aren't quite right. And there's that sense of separation. Or maybe on those occasions when we've read the Bible and maybe just closed the Bible very, very quickly because we don't much like what it says. Or, or maybe in the hearing of the preaching of the Word of God. It, it's just a little bit too close to the, to the, to, to the truth. Yeah? And, and we feel that distance. Or maybe we become aware at times of the very brevity of our life. The desperation of it all. Maybe the whole pointlessness of the whole thing. And that one day, one day this life is going to end. And that this life is really a dying life. And this death is really a living death. And we need to be ready to meet God. Well, if you ever feel like this leper has felt, can I just uh, ask you to, to put into practice what this leper did? Who is seeing Jesus? He fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. You could write above that little verse, faith, faith. That's real faith. That's the reality of faith. That is the faith that rests upon the Lord Jesus. Yes. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, if you were here uh, on a Monday, I believe it was. Was it a Monday? Yes, it was a Monday because we were meant to go away and we didn't. Uh, the, this room was full not of a congregation, but it was full of police officers. And there was a conversation going on uh, amongst those police officers as they looked at some of the texts on the wall. It was a kind of theological discussion. And they were questioning the prepositions. You know about prepositions, don't you? <laughs> prepositions. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. One police officer said to the other, should that not on your wall say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, Actually, I don't mind what, what, what they did. They could do either or. I'm quite happy with either. But there is a reason for believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what that really means is this. I'm going to take my life. I'm going to take all of my hopes and aspirations. 
I'm going to take you even that judgment and sin that's going to drag me into the deepest, darkest hell. And instead of bearing it myself and struggling myself and trying to work it out myself, I'm going to take everything I have and I'm going to rest it on the Lord Jesus. He's going to be the foundation for my life now and he's going to be the hope of everything that I have for eternity. I'm going to, in a sense, in my spirit, put into practice what this leper puts into in verse 12 of Luke chapter 5. Who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, You know, Lord, I've got no hope in anybody else. I've got no future by any other means. You are my only hope. Only the eternal power of the God of heaven is able to change me and save me. And I'm going to cast everything I have on you. That, of course, is the message of the thief on the cross. What are you going to tell the thief on the cross as, he, as his egg timer is turned upside down? I'm going to have to try a bit harder. Eh? Go and do a bit of mindfulness. Try yoga. I don't know. Or a bit silly, isn't it? He's only got one hope. One hope. Resting in the Lord Jesus. One hope. A saviour who died for him. One hope. A saviour who finished the work. One hope. A saviour who God sent to save him. One hope. A saviour who entered into suffering and death for the judgment of his sins and said, It's finished! One hope! Well, that leper has that one hope. He casts himself in the Lord Jesus. No better place for him to go with him. Uh, and you read the rest of the story. Their time is gone, really. But you read the rest of the story. That leper became a non-leper. And that was pretty remarkable. You know, a good long time since that had happened. And such was the transformation in his life. For some reason, the Lord Jesus had told him in a sense to kind of keep it quiet. An interesting question as to why he did that. But anyway, verse 15, it didn't matter. <laughs> so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and be healed of him by their infirmities. Such was the radical transformation of the life of that leper. You couldn't keep a lid on it. <laughs> everybody knew. Everybody saw it. And everybody wanted something of the Lord Jesus. What saviour? Let's pray. Our Father, we do come into thy presence this afternoon. We thank thee, our Father, for a glorious saviour. We, we give thanks, our Father, that no matter how deep the difficulty and the gloom of our life is, that that indeed is no challenge to a glorious and great God and saviour. We thank thee, our Father, for thy Son. We look, our Father, at our own desperate need, lives that are short, as brief, uh, the very marks our Father of time are seen it uh, on our brows and in our heads and uh, uh, we know them, our Father, in our bodies and we know, Father, that ultimately at the end of this life there is the reality of meeting the God of heaven. It is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. But how we thank you, our Father, for a great gospel, a great good news that God loved this world so much that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank thee, our Father, for those that came to the Saviour over the years. Those that cried, remember me, cleanse me, save me, have mercy upon me. And we thank thee, our Father, that they did what the Word of God instructs us to do, to rest in him, to depend upon him, to turn in faith to the Lord Jesus, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that we might be saved. How we offer thanks for thy son. We pray that thou bless thy word to us uh, this afternoon as we offer thanks in the name and for